work. Okay. There we go. Yay. Jeez. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> and hopefully people at home will chime back on. This is also recorded and put on our YouTube. So all of our other programs are also available on our YouTube channel. If so I'll turn it over to you, Michael. Thank you. So I'm glad to be back here. This is my third uh, May lecture, three years I've done these. Uh, so I'm glad to always be back here and, and share something new. So um, today's uh, presentation is on Kate Raftery's River Street Beautification Project. From Slum to Vista of Beauty. These words of William F. McDermott, a featured news writer for the Chicago Daily News, appeared in a 1929 article describing Kate Raftery's visionary revitalization efforts along the Fox River at Geneva, Illinois. Known to most as the founder of the Little Traveler Shop, uh, Kate Raftery came to Geneva from Evanston by way of Aurora. Kate was a passionate promoter of her adopted hometown. The Chicago Daily News article described the conditions of Geneva's slum, their words, that deeply troubled Kate Raftery. While it's difficult to imagine today's River Lane as a slum lined with rundown shanties, lying in unkempt yards, strewn with tin cans, rubbish, and other household debris, that is exactly how River Street appeared a century ago. But the historic evolution of River Street began long before Kate Raftery arrived at Geneva. And Kate Raftery's visionary plan for revitalization, as well as her ability to carry out that plan, was rooted in a number of factors that were inextricably intertwined. Throughout Kane County, the energy of the Fox River was harnessed first with water wheels and later with turbines that powered sawmills, foundries, grist mills, furniture factories, paper mills, and other pioneer industries. Most commonly, the pioneer laborers settled near the factories where they worked. Ira Menard, who settled at St. Charles in 1834, had been instrumental in the development of St. Charles, where he built the first dam, bridge, store, and mill. By 1848, Menard owned land at Geneva on the east bank of the Fox River, north of State Street, where the earliest water-powered industries had been established in the early 1850s. Menard acquired the west bank of the Fox River at Geneva and in 1855 platted lots on two blocks. One block north of State Street, identified in green here on this image, and a larger block on the south side of State Street, which consisted of 27 lots. While the green lots, the green area um, sold out very quickly for industry, the area marked in red developed much more slowly over time. This detail from the 1869 bird's eye view of Geneva shows the minimal development in the present day River Lane neighborhood at that time. The, the, land, the lowlands along the West Bank was highly susceptible to seasonal flooding as well as ice jams during the winter months. By 1900, a number of livery stables were built along the east side of River Street between present day James and Campbell Streets. Livery stables provided horses, carriages, and wagons for rent, along with saddles, bridles, and farm implements. Worn out wagons and implements were often abandoned at the river's edge with the hope that the wood and iron materials brought away and the remnants would either sink to the bottom of the riverbed or be washed further downstream for someone else to deal with. Horses were pastured in large paddocks adjoining the stables. Routinely, animal waste and discarded hay and straw were spread throughout the paddocks, which bordered the Fox River, and overland runoff from these paddocks washed down into the river itself. Throughout the 19th century, the lowlands along the Fox River were plagued with destructive seasonal flooding and contaminated water, resulting from the industries and pastures that lined both banks of the Fox River at Geneva. 
The polluted river environment promoted diseases such as cholera, yellow fever, scarlet fever, and ague. By the dawn of the 20th, by the dawn of the 20th century, the industrialized Fox River Valley was often smoke-filled and the polluted waterway was inundated with a combination of rubbish and industrial debris. Most of the earliest homes that lined River Street were modest wood frame structures, although some were built of locally quarried limestone. As seen at the image to the right, landscapes of laborers' homes along the river tended to be less manicured than lawns of properties on the upper rise where the town of Geneva had been laid out above and also upwind of the industrialized river valley. In his article and accompanying photographs, Chicago Daily News writer, William McDermott, captured the River Street conditions that troubled Kate Raftery. In 1925, as she began her beautification efforts, these were the conditions that Kate faced. But what other factors inspired this visionary woman in this ambitious undertaking? The progressive movement, which began as a domestic agenda to improve the quality of life in America, swept across America in the 1890s and gained strength until the outbreak of World War I. The progressive movement focused on the betterment of community through sanitation and food safety, as well as political rights for women and workers. Theodore Roosevelt, president from 1901 to 1909, became the most well-known personality of the Progressive Party between 1912 and 1919 when he died. After World War I, members of the upper class and urbanites abandoned the ideals of the progressive movement. However, in many small towns and rural areas, progressive movement ideals continued to be pursued throughout the Great Depression. At Geneva, the Geneva Improvement Association was formed in 1890 when 12 local women asked to join a men's group that had been established in 1884. Their purpose was to beautify and improve the Geneva community. The Geneva Improvement Association disbanded in 1913 and reorganized the Geneva Women's Club. During World War I, women entered the labor force and learned traditionally male skills. Also, women had gained the right to vote on August 18, 1920, and became an increasingly stronger force in civic affairs. On the home front, many household goods, such as refrigerators, radios, beds, living room furniture, and pianos were more accessible to the American public than ever before. And all could be acquired on an easy payment plan as credit was extended to the middle class, to middle class Americans. This new class of consumers enjoyed the expansion of department stores and chain stores and their newfound access to goods. Also at this time, indoor bathrooms and plumbing, central heating, electricity, and telephones helped promote good sanitation and healthier living, which were major social causes of the first decades of the 20th century. Along with household goods, affordable housing with modern amenities such as indoor bathrooms, central heating, water heaters, and sanitary kitchens, even attached garages were increasingly more accessible to a larger number of Americans. As early as 1920, many Americans living in large cities were enjoying an economic boom. During the Roaring Twenties, urbanites danced to Charleston and enjoyed bathtub gin, while newly independent young professional women were learning how to drive in greater numbers than ever before. However, many less affluent urbanites and many residents of small towns or rural areas continue to work in manual trades. Many of the working class, particularly recent immigrants, lived in substandard housing with little sanitation and minimal or no electricity or central heat. American slums became an increasingly more visible problem in the early 20th century. In big cities, 
but also in small towns where the landscape was plagued with increasing amounts of rubbish and discarded junk generated from a rising appetite for consumerism. In Geneva, several junkyards were established in the early 20th century. In 1904, John Strader of Geneva purchased the property at the northeast corner of Campbell and Sixth Streets. Three years later, the site was being advertised as Strader's Pit, which was ready to receive rubbish with no decaying matter. About the same time, the Becker Salvage Yard was established on North River Street. However, many American working class families, including some along Geneva's River Street, lived in squalor as junk and trash piled up around their homes. At the turn of the century, they said the Geneva Improvement Association was led largely by Geneva women, and they organized to address small projects that would improve public life in the community. When the GIA disbanded in 1913, the newly formed Geneva Women's Club continued many of the activities and supported causes of the GIA. As the new century dawned, Geneva's business district experienced a building boom that continued throughout the first three decades of the 20th century resulting in a modern looking town. The rise of the streetcar and automobile along with paved roads, such as the Lincoln Highway established in 1912, allowed more mobility and a desire of many small town civic leaders to showcase their community as modern and up-to-date and as a desirable place to visit or possibly to even call home. Increasing numbers of tourists traveled through the Geneva area and the local chamber of commerce worked to improve the local business community. Into this environment entered Kate Raftery, a woman of considerable means who had established in 1922 her own business that would become the Little Traveler. A leader in many civic improvement efforts, Kate Raftery's vision to transform the slum-like appearance of South River Street as a reimagined vista of beauty was her most ambitious undertaking in a storied career that encouraged other women to open businesses, working together to make Geneva the best community possible for residents and visitors alike. Three significant events in the early 1920s likely sparked Kate Raftery's efforts towards the beautification River Street. First and foremost, Kate Raftery enthusiastically supported and promoted the professional ambitions of her son, John Howard Raftery, who attended Princeton University between 1916 and 1919. However, John or Howard's studies uh, were interrupted at Princeton by World War I when he volunteered to serve as an early aviator serving in both England and France during the war. After the war, Raftery returned to Princeton, but did not graduate, instead accepting a position in the Chicago office of architect Frank Davis Chase. In 1922, Raftery returned to college, entering the Massachusetts Institute of Technology as a junior and graduated in the class of 1924. Some history say he graduated in 1925, but the MIT technique shows him as a graduate of 1924, um, in case anybody is telling <laughs> all those little details. I know there's always one in every crowd. Um, he worked in the New York office of architect John Russell Pope until the autumn of 1925, when Raftery attended the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. While there, Raftery was stricken with infantile paralysis, or polio, and returned to Geneva to recuperate. During that period, Howard Raftery collaborated with his mother, Kate, on the first of the River Street renovations, as well as designed for a new house to be built on River Street. During his recuperation, Raftery began an association with Geneva architect Walter Frazier, according to Frazier's 1956 American Institute of Architects professional record. I bring that up also because if you look at their two um, uh, accounts of their, uh, so when they associated, 
Walter Frazier says they associated 1925, and Howard Rafteries in his professional records say they associated 1927. Um, and uh, it appears that uh, Howard Raftery was doing some work with Walter Frazier, and Walter Frazier counted that as when they started their professional relationship. Um, but uh, I don't think Howard counted it until he was getting a regular steady paycheck <laughs> of, the, of the business. Um, Howard Raftery left for Europe in the fall of 1926 to attend the American Academy in Rome. And upon graduation in 1927, Howard Raftery returned to Geneva and joined Walter Frazier's architectural firm and be eventually became a full partner in 1932. Undoubtedly, Kate's interest in architecture increased as her son's career blossomed. The second factor encouraging Kate Raftery's ambitious beautification plan may have been rooted in the efforts of a family that moved from Chicago to Geneva. Martin Sekulik was a widowed Eastern European immigrant who came to America with his young son. At Chicago, he married his second wife, Helen. And after World War I, the Sekulik family began spending summers in Geneva. In 1920, the Sekulik family purchased the one and a half story shanty of the Axel Isaacson family. At that time, River Street was home to a large number of immigrant laborers, many of them of Italian descent, resulting in the riverfront neighborhood being referred to as the Sicilian colony. And when the Sekulik family moved permanently to River Street around 1922, many of the neighboring River Street homes were substandard with debris filled yards. Starting from scratch, Martin and Helen Sekulik, with the help of their children, may have been the first residents to transform property along the west bank of the Fox River, south of State Street. In these three uh, maps of consecutive uh, time frames, the Sekulik property is identified in the um, yellow. Um, some people believe, or some, some historians believe the one and a half story portion of the Isaacson Sekulik house was originally constructed as one of the barns associated with earlier livery stables that occupied the stretch of River Street. I've highlighted the, uh, the um, livery stable and the, and the associated outbuildings in gold on the map. Um, and you can see how they changed and, and, and were disappeared over time between 1897 and uh, 1923. If the house began as an early barn, the utilitarian structure was likely converted to a crude home between 1912 and 1917. Between 1920 and 1924, the Sekulik family cleaned up the riverbank and the river itself. The Geneva Republican noted that from the Fox River, they dragged such items as a cook stove, a farm wagon, and a water tank, along with thousands of smaller discarded items. By 1949, the Sekulik's River Street property was a tidy home set within a beautifully landscaped park-like lawn. The third factor that I think uh, um, affected Kate Raftery in her ambitious goal was an event in Aurora, Illinois. Carl Rudolph Kraft was a successful commercial artist and a noted painter of landscapes. Mr. Kraft lived in Chicago and later Oak Park, but he had frequently visited the Fox River Valley in pursuit of scenes to immortalize in his paintings. Mr. Kraft of Chicago was a close friend of Roy Horton Conklin, who operated the Conklin Art Studio, um, a, a gallery that was located in the Aurora National Bank building in downtown Aurora. Mr. Conklin, in turn, was a friend of Roy C. Haynes, the head of the Aurora Chamber of Commerce. In the early 1920s, the three men supported the establishment of the Aurora Art League, which continues today. Kraft himself was, a highly, was highly regarded as the painter of the Ozarks and was a recipient of the Logan Medal awarded by Chicago's Art Institute. The three men promoted the idea of establishing affordable studio homes for aspiring artists at Aurora. Although the art colony never materialized at Aurora, this 1922 Geneva Republican article must have caught Kate's attention and inspired her to think about developing a similar artist colony here in Geneva. However, in 1922, Kate Raftery was absorbed in establishing the Geneva gift shop that would become Little Traveler.
More than three years after the plans for an art colony at Aurora were announced, but never materialized, Kate Raftery initiated her efforts to beautify River Street. One week before Christmas 1925, the Geneva Republican announced that she and a North Shore associate had assembled a large number of properties in the vicinity of River Street. As one of their first projects, Kate Raftery and her husband Edmund remodeled a house on the corner of Campbell and River Streets. Built in the late 1840s and occupied by Irish immigrant John O'Brien by the close of the 1840s, the renovated house was intended to serve as a model for an artist's home and studio. However, the Raftery family themselves moved into the house upon completion and returned periodically for brief periods over the next several decades when the house was not being rented to others. The house was featured in the 1929 Chicago Daily News article um, that proclaimed the success of Kate Raftery's efforts. And the um, picture is shown in the upper um, right corner from the newspaper. The um, building to the rear was added sometime after 1930. Um, so it appears, and some, I have not been able to document it, but it appears that it's an early school that was attached to the back of the, uh, the building based on the layout of the uh, rooms inside. In fact, has anybody been in the back addition on the, on the house? There's a pair of double doors on the back side of the house. Um, and they lead into, if you see that first little window, they lead into a small little vestibule, like a cloak room, and then opens up into a big room that served as a later master bedroom um, in the house. It's a very interesting um, little bit, but it's definitely been pushed up, up against the earlier house. Another of the early remodeled houses that was, in, was intended for artists as well. The living room at this house is attached, is, I'm sorry, the living room addition to this house is attributed to the architects Walter Frazier and Howard Raftery, but I've not find a date uh, for that uh, design. As if the River, um, River Street beautification project was not ambitious enough, in 1928, Kate Raftery moved an entire house, um, the circa 1845 Augustus Conant house from the southwest corner of First and Campbell Streets. She moved this to one of the open areas in the, lot, the land she recently acquired um, in 1925, and the house was moved to make room for a new house for the Kenyon families. Likely the plans for the remodeled Greek Revival house were drawn by Howard Raftery himself. One of the um, additions to the uh, original house is this uh, new, uh, classical foyer and closed foyer at the front of the house. It was not part of the original house. And also the curious uh, tower um, feature at the center of the roof. Built before 1848, this house was home to uh, first Edward Masterson and then his brother, Patrick Masterson, both Irish immigrants who came to Geneva to work for the railroad. The former Masterson house was likely one of the last homes remodeled by Kate Raftery in her effort to attract artisans to the River Street neighborhood. Originally, Kate Raftery's vision of remodeling and refurbishing the River Street shanties originated as a plan to provide affordable home studios for aspiring artists. However, the original artist colony concept was altered when the land south of Kate Raftery's purchases was developed for new houses. In 1919, Frank W. Renwick, the president of the Chicago Gravel Company, acquired the Augustus Harrington Estate, which he renamed Eastview. He also purchased Block 89, which stretched eastward from that property to the Fox River. In 1924, Frank W. Renwick sold the Eastview estate to his son, George, and two years later platted Block 89 as the Riverside addition. The Renwick land had been developed with very few, uh, prior to this time, the Renwick land had been developed with very few structures. Therefore, the Riverside addition was planned for new houses primarily. Within a short period, within a short time period, the River Street neighborhood became very popular 
and soon the artist colony concept gave way to redevelopment with large architect designed homes for wealthier residents and corporate professionals moving from Chicago and Chicago's North Shore. One of the first homes in this market was designed by Howard Raftery in 1926. This, uh, the blueprint shows the, the house um, right across from the word street um, where it was where it platted and, and, and being built. After coming home from Paris to recuperate from his infantile paralysis, Howard Raftery designed this unusual house in 1926. The house does not have a local precedent, but the design of this house undoubtedly was influenced by Raftery's brief exposure to old world architecture while he was in Europe. The Wilson brothers uh, worked on several of Kate Raftery's um, homes, in both old and new, and continued to do so throughout Mrs. Raftery's lifetime. In April of 1927, a local newspaper described River Street between Franklin and Campbell Streets as little more than a wagon path and a mud hole. In the summer of 1929, the city of Geneva acquired the right of way to assure the continuity of River Street. After many unsuccessful attempts to pave the continuous thoroughfare over the objections of property owners, River Street was finally paved from South Street northward to State Street in 1930. Among the first new homes built was the Wood Yerkes House that may have been a design collaboration between Walter Frazier, Howard Raftery, and Wallace F. Yerkes, an up-and-coming architect on Chicago's North Shore. Born in 1900, W.F. Yerkes, as he was known professionally, received his BS in architecture from the Armour Institute of Technology, which is now the Illinois Institute of Technology. He received his degree in 1922 and began his career in the office of Clark and Walcott, in Chicago before becoming a designer draftsman in the house of Russell L. Walcott. Between 1926 and 1930, W.F. Yerkes was associated with Edgar, Edgar A. Lynch and completed several commissions for traditionally influenced residences in Chicago's Gold Coast neighborhood and several North Shore communities. Both Howard Raftery and and, and I'm sorry, both the Raftery family and Walter Frazier had connections to Chicago's North Shore communities, and Frazier had North Shore commissions, and architects were known to collaborate from time to time in that area, in that era. Sorry. In any case, Wallace Yerke's parents purchased the River Street house after the death of the original owner in 1935. This is one of a handful of houses that continue to be built along River Street throughout the Great Depression owing to the serenity and the beauty of the, as, of the street as it was developing. Most of the houses of that era were designed by Fraser and Raftery, who had established their formal business partnership in 1932. This home was built in 1937 by local contractor August Wilson for the reported sum of $20,000. Samuel Insull was a British-born American business magnate, an innovator and investor based in Chicago who greatly contributed to creating an integrated electrical infrastructure in the United States and was the owner of the Commonwealth Edison Electric Company that served all of Chicago. Insull was notable for purchasing utilities and railroads, often using holding companies. He was also responsible for the building of the Chicago Civic Opera House in 1929. During the Great Depression, while he lived at this house, Insel's vast Midwest holding company empire collapsed, and his $100 million fortune had dwindled to $1,000 or less at the time of his death in 1938. The Martin Sekulik Senior Home, likely the first River Street property to be rehabilitated, was sold in 1949 and then sold the following year to Emerson and Arliss Cox. Beginning in May of 1955, Mr. and Mrs. Cox added several one-story additions to the south side of the original home. Mrs. Cox remained in the River Street home for 65 years until her death in 2015, 
But as she aged, the manicured grounds established by the Seculix and maintained by Mrs. Cox until her health failed, slowly disappeared in the, until the grounds were once again unkempt. Construction of new houses on River Street continued throughout the Great Depression at a slow rate. However, during World War II and the material shortages immediately following the war years, not a single house was built on River Street for almost an entire decade. However, all of that changed in the spring of 1950 when a number of houses were built along the street. The new wave of home building reflected the new trends in residential architecture, smaller homes with restrained architectural detail that broke free of the more interpretive homes designed previously by Raftery and Frazier. With the construction of these homes, Kate Raftery's transformation Kate Raftery's transformative vision of the River Street environs was nearing its final realization, almost a quarter of a century after it was first initiated. Her, her willingness to keep with things just is inspiring to me. Um, most people give up after a couple months. Um, she she um, soldiered on. So some of the new style houses that were being built that uh, departed dramatically from the uh, pre-war houses um, are these uh, sprawling ranch houses um, that sprung up along the south end of, of River Street. The Johnson family moved from Evanston to Geneva and he served as the vice president of a Chicago-based printing company. The architects of this home were Arthur Swanson Associates of Chicago known for their modern ranch residences amongst other projects. Begun in March of 1950, the, the original modest house has been enlarged several times uh, since its first construction more than 70 years ago. And I underlined the 70 years because I was uh, talking to somebody about this and well, if it can't be 70 years, oh, I guess it could be 70 years, uh, these, these uh, ranch houses. Mr. and Mrs. Douglas uh, Porter completed this home at 322 South River Street, also in March of 1950. Mr. Porter was associated with a construction company and completed much of the work himself. And then a few short years later, he built the garage behind the house um, as well. In September of 1949, a building permit was filed for the construction of a Cape Cod residence at 417 South River Street in Renwick's Riverside Addition. The home was built for Dr. Edward and Marie Fraz by local contractor John H. Bloomdahl from plans purchased from a building plan service rather than being a custom design plan produced by an architect. Dr. Fraz was a dentist for the practice of Chicago where the family had lived before relocating to Geneva. In March of 1950, the Fraz family moved into their new home, which included an attached single car garage. This home for Mr. and Mrs. Roscoe Sappenfield was designed by Fraser and Raftery architects and reflected the firm shift towards modernism. Mr. Sappenfield was the president of the Campana Corporation on Batavia Avenue. Construction of this house was also begun in March of 1950. So you can imagine the south side, south end of River Street in 1950 was just a buzz of activity again after no activity for an entire decade. And underscoring that, the Geneva Republican is filled with notices about um, the flurry of activity of new homes. And in almost every um, monthly report, there's a re reference to a house either being built, being remodeled, or being uh, continued under new construction. When the Chicago Daily News published this prophetic headline in November of 1929, no one could have imagined that the transformation of River Street would span nearly 40 years from inception to completion. Although Kate Raftery died in 1953, she had witnessed the realization revision three decades earlier. She rid Geneva of an embarrassing slum. She had encouraged the arts in her adopted hometown, and she had celebrated her son's success as an architect, working alongside him and his colleagues as River Street evolved. Kate Raftery was an ambitious, an impassioned advocate for the arts, her friends, her son, and Geneva. 
As an apparent final affirmation of Kate Raftery's successful revitalization efforts, the Geneva City Council in 1961 captured the quaintness of the reborn neighborhood, christening the waterfront thoroughfare, the more genteel river lane that we use today. While many present day residents may be unaware of Kate Raftery's influence on the evolution of River Lane, the riverfront neighborhood remains a vista of, be a vista of beauty <laughs> to this day, thanks to Kate Raftery's unwavering commitment to a vision. That is my presentation. Yeah. Anybody has any questions that I try to answer about River Street that I didn't touch on? I, I have really gotten very involved in River Street. I've, I've, I've come, uh, just, I've just dug in almost every property you're looking at. So if anybody does have a question, I'd be glad to try to answer it. So, does anyone own that? I mean, somebody might own that secluded property, but it still looks right down. It's still owned by family members. It's still owned by family members. I, I, I speak to them on occasion, but uh, they are uh, not doing anything with the property at this point. Yeah. So how many properties did she actually work on to touch? We don't know for sure, um, because uh, some of the some of the properties we know that she had some influence in. We don't know um, if she had sold the land by then or whatever. But I think it's about sixteen properties is what I kind of come to the conclusion. But I could be off by five or six, either you know, either way. She, she, here's uh, one thing that's amazing about Kate Raftery is that um, she was very humble in 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 promoting herself. It seems, but she was very active in promoting her son. Um, so she lived kind of vicariously through his success, and I think she was quite pleased with that. From everything I've read, she just seemed to be this very humble person. Was just very happy to see her son be so successful in his his trade. And so a lot of things are credited to Howard Raffey, but when you look at the whole picture, you can't help but think that she had her finger um, somewhere in that, in some of those cases. Yeah, yeah. did her son stay in the community? Yes. Oh, yeah, he did. Okay. Yeah. He built a, a really fabulous house on the east side of the Fox River in 1952, I believe it is, um, it's on Bennett Street. So it's just a really fabulous house. It's still there. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, Frazier's. Yes, right next door to each other. 102 and 120. I lived across the street from the Krulich house for a while because I owned the McKinley house across the street. And uh, Emerson Cox was my neighbor. And I, I got to know him fairly well. And he was a really interesting man. And his house looks the same today as it looked in 1982. He uh, like the overgrown um, uh, atmosphere, it, it contributed to his privacy and so forth. Yet he was an engineer and he was extremely meticulous about snow removal, for example. He would, from his one car garage, he would shovel the wheel track and then just take off enough snow in the middle. And it was very precise about it so that he wouldn't get hung up on it. Because I remember that from the winter of 79 when, you know, we were all snowed in. And uh, he was, he did his thing and was out quicker than anybody else. So I think um, maybe it was answered. I've been told by people who've lived in Geneva for a while that the front yard was very different than the backyard of their own. True. Yeah, he liked the that, he likes the brambly kind of look at the front. Yeah, of the, it was, I brambly is very accurate. <laughs> Mrs. Cox likes to keep it very neat in the back, and um, that's what I've always heard, at least since I've been here. And an uh, interesting st uh, story there, their daughter's bedroom is exactly the way she left it the day she graduated from high school. <laughs> Upstairs in the house. Exactly. <laughs> Nothing's been moved. <laughs> hey, Michael, up? thank you very much. Excellent. Very good. You're very welcome. Okay, and, uh, we have a drawing to do here from Little Traveler, so. Those of you who are in attendance, we uh, entered a drawing to win. Uh, what do we have, Betsy? A pillow? So you can have lunch and take that. <laughs> I'm going to let Michael, will you draw the winner for me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you don't get to take a Thank you all for joining us.
I get it. Jewel Jensen. Oh, hi. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Michael. Oh, that's great. I like this. That's awesome. Congrats, Jewel. Thank you. Oh, gosh, that's great. Thank you, everyone.